When I was younger, every, everyone asked me what I wanted to be when I grew up. I knew I wanted to care for people. And because people told me I was smart, and because of the parents I had and how I was raised, I was taught that I needed to achieve. So, a doctor. A doctor I will be, sure. We'll do that. So many things around my later childhood years, my teen years, and my college preparation had been geared then around me wanting to be a doctor because that's what I had said early on. I paid more attention to my biology and chemistry classes in high school because I figured that would be my future. I figured my ACT and SAT scores would be relevant not only for college, but also medical school, so I felt like I needed to perform at a high level. When I dreamed about my future, I was already accounting for medical school and residency. When I thought about my future life, I pictured myself at patients' beds, holding their hands and guiding them through the toughest times of their lives. Now, I am one who had the great privilege to go to college. I picked my school based on, of course, their pre-med program. And I went excited and told everyone, I'm pre-med, I'm going to be a doctor. And then I hated it. <laughs> I hated it. It was just memorization and regurgitation. And I had to have a whole bunch of classes where I had to learn about stems and cells of leaves and flowers. And I didn't care. <laughs> and all of the words were in Latin. And I didn't know what they meant. And it didn't make any sense. And where did you get to talk about helping people and doing all of the things? And I just was like, no. I actually had some of my pre-med friends and I said, you all go ahead and take the classes. I'm going to watch what you're studying. I might change my mind, but I think I'm out. Now, you might imagine that this created some existential, you know, challenges, <laughs> chaos for my parents. <laughs> they wanted to know what I was going to do. My whole life had been planned around this. What do you mean you don't like it? This is what you always said you wanted to do. What was your plan? What was it going to be if you didn't do this? Now, it was a little bit of an existential crisis for me, too, but I think it would have been much less if I hadn't been asked all the time, what was I going to be when I grew up? What I really loved in college were the English classes. The classes where you read something and then you spent the whole class period talking about it. You could discuss big questions that didn't have easy answers, where I could learn different perspectives from my fellow classmates and my teachers, and where there was a never-ending source of new learning and exploration through the world of books. When I told these parents that I wanted to be an English literature major, their faces were horrified, <laughs> terrified, confused, pasted with that look of, dear God, you want what? I remember clearly my father asking what I could do with an English major. Did I want to be a teacher? Nope. I don't want to teach, but I don't know what I want to do yet. That look stayed on their face. It turns out that I was just fine. I got a job after college, and then I changed it four more times. And in my 40s, I decided I wanted to go towards a very different career, one that turns out would have me at that initial plan of being at patients' beds, holding their hands, guiding them through the toughest times in their lives. I made a lot of other decisions as well to get married, 
to have two kids, to move several times, to get divorced, to come out, to get married again, to move to be with you all here in Phoenix. I wish I could go back and tell my childhood self that a, you do not need to know what you're going to be for the rest of your life when you are eight. <laughs> I wish I could tell her that my whole life was going to be a bunch of decisions. That it is not the end of the world if you change your mind and go a different direction. In fact, as I look at it, most, some of the most rewarding and transformative times of my life were when I changed my mind and went a different direction. Some of those de decisions are difficult, of course. Some of them have ramifications on other people, yes. But they are your decisions young Christine, and you can make as many as you want over and over again. According to Eva Krakow, who is a lecturer at the University of Leicester in the United Kingdom, your brain makes upwards of 35,000 decisions each day. We make so many that there are actual decisions called decision, or actual conditions called decision fatigue. We decide what we are going to have for breakfast each morning or if we are going to have it, what we are going to wear, our path to work, how we manage that tricky situation with a friend, which book to read, and whether we want to read, crochet, or watch 90 Day Fiance tonight. <laughs> so why do some decisions paralyze us? I wish all of us had a mentor like Johnny Lifshitz, someone who can tell you that decisions can be changed, that everything will work out all right, and that you're doing a great job as long as you listen to your morals and your values. There are many big decisions that some of you in this room have made. Maybe you were raised in the Latter-day Saint faith and now you are a Unitarian Universalist. That's a big decision that has a lot of ramifications. Maybe you were born with one name and now you have a different name. I bet there were a number of big decisions with that one. Maybe decisions were made for you. Maybe you decided that you wanted children but then couldn't have them, or vice versa, decided that you didn't want them, but then biology and legislatures might have meant that you did have them. Maybe there were things that happened to you that weren't in your control, but you made decisions around how you were going to handle it. One of the many things I love about Unitarian Universalism is that it is a faith of changing our minds. Reverend Christine Robinson, one of my mentors, says that UUism is inherently agnostic. Now, whether you identify as an agnostic or not, let just consider this. If we were absolutely sure about everything, is this really the place for us? <laughs> we each have a little, and for some it may be very little, a little bit, some of us it's a lot, a bit about us that is not totally sure about everything that we believe, and we are open to hearing more exploring more, living into our faith more, and hearing other people's perspectives. Some of us have had huge changes in our lives. Some of us have had many changes in our faith. How many people have changed what you believe at least once in this room? I was going to say, how many might be over five? <laughs> Still quite a few. Some of us had those changes before coming here, and others have had them while we've been here, and both. 
My thinking around decisions is grounded in my belief around process theology, which some of you have heard me preach about. It's a pretty complicated theology, but one of the pieces is that we all make decisions and that we have free will around our decisions. Through those decisions, we, and not God, change the world. Each decision I make has a small impact. Hopefully, it's for good on the world. Each decision you make has an impact on the world. And together, we can't do huge things, but we can all make small decisions one at a time to change ourselves, to impact each other, and together to make the world a better place. Therefore, I believe our decisions are sacred. They are an extension of ourselves, and they are an extension of our values. But in describing these thoughts about decision-making, how they're not permanent, how they do have impact, the commonality is that we do them together. So I actually want to cede about six minutes of my sermon to you all where we've got the opportunity share the, to share the answers of two questions with each other. Now first, for our introverts, for whom the words that I just said share with each other just struck terror in you, <laughs> I'm giving you the option first. You are, glad, you are welcome to reflect on those, these questions yourself. You can sit with your hands open like this to show that you're going to think in your own head about this decision. For those online, I would love for you to reflect in your online group by chatting with each other and learning from each other in the chat, if you are willing. And anyone else here in person, find someone or two someones, maybe someone you don't know as well, and discuss these two questions. One is, what was a decision that you made that you thought was going to be permanent, but you changed your mind? And two, what is the impact of that changed decision? Okay, let me say that again. What's the decision that you made that you thought was going to be permanent? It turns out it wasn't. And two, what is the impact of that change decision? I'm going to give you about six minutes for this. So if you have a pair, that's about three minutes each to share. If you've got three minutes, that's about two minutes to share. See, I just did the math for you. <laughs> Use that to decide how many people you want to talk with or if you want to contemplate on your own. I'll ring the bell when we're done. Go ahead. I'm loving seeing how the interaction is, particularly in the chat here, online folks. Thank you all for participating. I'm so, so glad that that happened on so many levels. How did that work for you all? Good. It's a quick six. It's a what? It was a quick six. It was a quick six. You and I have got a class to lead, Sam. Yeah, it's, I mean, there's six.